So, um, what we're going to do today uh, is going to be a little bit different than what we have been doing. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to jump a thousand years. And we're going to cover a thousand years in one sitting. Um, so I, there's, the, there's not a lot of ideas and stuff that we want to talk about. Um, we're going to just, I'm going to share a lot of highlights and things that happened in that thousand years. Uh, because um, there wasn't the ideas and the, the doctrines were kind of set and settled. But for that thousand years, there wasn't really anything new that was introduced as far as concepts or asking questions of like deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. There wasn't, you know, how are people say we've discussed all these things, okay? Um, but the church was growing, okay? And so we're going to look at that thousand years. So what's different about nor normal is than what we've normally do is we usually have a discussion. This is just, I'm going to take the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes to share with you what happened. So today is the history class. Okay. But there's no test at the end. And, uh, and feel free to ask questions because what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect a lot of ideas and philosophies and, and different events that happened to get us to the point where we are. And so once again, that, that thousand years, there's, there's a ton of things that happen. So don't, don't think that it's unimportant in church history. It's very important in church history. But as far as what we're trying to accomplish to get to, well, well how did we get here? How did, how did we as Hillside Baptist Church get here? How, how, why do we have the name Baptist on the door? It's, there's, there's a lot that we can just kind of skip over uh, between uh, the 300s and the 1300s. Okay, so there, there's a few things um, that we're just to do a little bit of a recap. We have seen how the early church reacted to several theological issues like salvation, the Trinity. Uh, we've seen how, how they've, the discussion and the debates and the back and forth and, and, and looking at those things um, to get us to the 300s, uh, which I know we've, we've passed the 300s a few times, but that's because we're dealing with uh, ideas and philosophies. We have, we have seen how a good translation of the Bible that is in the common language helped shape the future of Christianity and something that we will see again with the King James Bible and something that we have been witnessing again with the introduction of newer translations. Okay, and, and, and that's, that's, you can kind of guess where I stand on it. Um, I, you know, King James Bible is a great Bible. Um, I think it's good that we have versions that are in the language that's more commonly spoke than the Victorian English. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's allowing uh, Christians to, to understand more uh, of what they read. And, so, and, and, we, and we, we saw that with, with Jerome taking that old Latin and going and learning Hebrew so that he could produce a, uh, a, the Latin Vulgate, which is the, the common language Bible, and, and, and made a collection and said, Here, here's the scriptures. Uh, so we, we saw how that helped shape and is kind of uh, very important to us even today. And we have seen how the Roman Catholic Church became the entity that it developed into. Uh, we, we've seen the, the, the establishing concepts that got it to where it is today. Um, with, you know, priests and nuns and the monasteries and the big cathedrals. And um, there, there's going to be some things that happen in this thousand years that we're going to talk about. But, but we've seen how, how a lot of its early stuff, we can, we can trace that back to how did, how did it get to where it is at today. And then 
we, we see that the king making doctrinal decisions uh, helped, shape the, helped shape the Catholic Church. The church playing political games with banishment of bishops, as we've seen, you know, banishing one bishop, bringing in another, uh, especially when around the Nicene Creed that that happened, also with Pelagius and um, Augustine in, in their debate, and they banished Pelagius for, for his views. Uh, we see now the monastics declaring their monasteries as being under the rule of the Pope, kind of got to where the church, where the Catholic church is today, um, and, and where that, how they, how they kind of got there. What we haven't seen is, you know, why we're here, you know, and we don't do those things. We're, we're going to get to that, which is why we're going to take a thousand year jump. There is a, there is one more point that I do, that, that, that needs to be made, that around 754 AD, a document appeared that declared that Constantine had given land to the church in 330 AD. Okay, so in, in, in 754, and then this is very important, um, a document shows up. And what it says on it is that there's a piece of land in Rome that has been given to the church. This land became the Vatican. And it is also declared that the church, this, this document also declared that the church had political power. Okay, so this really helps establish the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, we, 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 we know what the Vatican is. Uh, anybody been to the Vatican? Anybody seen it? Been there? Got one, got two. Uh, my, my, my wife has been there. Uh, she, you know, she was an art history major. Um, so she loves the art, art and art history. And so um, they have great art there in the Vatican. So she went and stopped in there. Um, one of the places I'd like to go see someday. Um, don't know if I'll ever make it, but I'd like to be, go there. But that's what this document did. This document was declared a forgery in the 15th century. So in the 1400s. But its influence was too great to overcome. Okay, so... What that means is that document wasn't a real document, but the damage has been done. Okay, so now the church has political power, and the church has established land uh, in Rome. And so uh, that's how we get to well, how the Vatican got to be there. Um, because it has political power means it gets to collect taxes and it gets to, uh, you know, it gets funded that way um, and it becomes a political entity. So uh, that's, that's an important point that, that we need to, um, that it's just good for us to understand uh, how some of these things were happening. Okay, so... Once again, we're doing the we're going to do 300s AD to the 1300s AD, um, and so here's what we need to know about this time. And like I said, I'm sorry, this is a history lesson today. So if there was ever a day to miss, this one was it. Okay, we're not going to really have uh, much discussion upon ideas and uh, theology. We are just going to look at what happened. Uh, because there are things that did happen in this time that drastically influenced the church, but not in the sense of ideas and philosophies, okay? And, and I think you're going you're gonna to see that and, and kind of understand that. Okay, so Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church during this time, in that thousand years, are expanding through mission work. So we... How the church kind of started uh, was that because the Roman Empire controlled the Mediterranean, that's where Christianity was limited. Okay, so just think, if you, if you got the Mediterranean Sea, you know, so Italy is kind of a, the major landmass that sticks down into the Mediterranean. Um, and then you've got, you know, the top of Africa, you've got Israel on, on the east uh, side of it. And then, you know, so you just got this big circle around there. And that's where Rome had conquered. They used the Mediterranean Sea to conquer their land. 
okay? And so the further, the further away from the Mediterranean you went, the less influence the Roman Empire had, okay? Um, now, they did, they did have Britain and much of Germany. Uh, Germany eventually does surrender completely to the Roman Empire, but, you know, heading up north, you know, when you start to get up to, like, Norway and Sweden and up, up that way, um, they're, not, they're not under the Roman Empire, okay? But the church is expanding fast and very quickly through that region and through that area. It's going down through Africa and it's going across and it's heading east into Arabia and, and those areas. And so it's expanding very quickly through through mission work, um, and even is going all the way over to India. Okay, so the, the church is, is growing at a rapid pace. This expansion is rapid, and it's traveling great distance. So all of Europe, uh, you start to see, uh, like I said, uh, lots of the, the, the east, um, Israel, um, and moving east that way is becoming Christian, tra traveling down through Africa is becoming uh, Christianized. Um, and the church is mostly growing through all of Europe. Okay, so that's, that's where most of the influence is going, is through Europe. The church is plagued by forged documents, which we, we talked about for just a, just a moment, that forged document. So there's a, there's a bunch of forged documents and plagiarism. And plagiarism, for them, is putting an apostle's name on your work. Okay, so this is where you start to get these other gospels, um, things that are popping up 300, 400, 500 years after the apostles, uh, because some monk in a monastery, uh, what we figure, wrote a document and said, well, nobody's going to read this, so I'm going to slap an apostle's name on it, and I'm going to say it's the... Uh, the uh, the, uh, the gospel of Barnabas or the gospel of um, Bartholomew or whatever. Okay, so all of them have an, a gospel assigned to them at some point in time. But that, what that does is that, that leads uh, credence to certain things. And then you also have people going, wait, we have this sliver of wood. It's the piece of a cross. Of the cross. It's a piece of the cross. Um, so you have things like the Shroud of Torin pop up. You have, the, you have a spear that is declared the spear that pierced um, the side of Jesus that pops up. It, it actually is part of the, the Crusades. Um, that In the first crusade, it, it, it plays a part in that, this spear. Um, but you have these relics that start to pop up as well. Are they authenticated? We don't know. I, I've, I've read somewhere that if you were to assemble every piece of wood that claims to be a piece of the cross, you'd have 10 crosses. Okay, so we know that that can't be, right? So, um, you know, we don't know what happened to the cross. We don't know what happened to these things. Um, and I don't think at the time people thought to preserve them, you know, and say, oh, we need to keep that cross, right? They would just... You know, once he was taken off, they might have used it again for somebody else. Who knows what happened to that cross? Um, but uh, we, because, you know, it could be anywhere. Um, but that's, that's happening. So you have documents popping up. You have artifacts and relics that are pop popping up. Um, you know, you probably have heard of, uh, you know, King Arthur's quest for the, the grail, right? You know, that, that takes place as part of the Crusades, um, that story. Um, it comes out of that folklore of, well, what are the things that we're looking for? And that, you know, so these relics are popping up. This is the, this is the cup that Jesus used, and, um, and, and these sort of things are popping up. So also, the Pope's power in politics and doctrines is constantly increasing. So the Pope gains more political power. The Pope is, uh, and the church's influence over creating and saying, this is a doctrine that we are going to uh, live by. 
and this is what this means, and uh, you know that that the Pope has the power to uh, to say what Scripture means. Okay, that's that's going to come up, and that's going to lead us into the Reformation. Okay, that's one of the major issues in the Reformation, and so, uh, but but the Pope's political power, his influence is increasing. And so the church has become a massive entity uh, in people's lives. There's something else that we need to cover, which is the, cre- the, the creation of the Byzantine Empire. So if you ever read church history, uh, you read this all the time. The Byzantine Empire, under the Byzantine Empire. And I was just, one day I was like, I don't even know what that is. What is the Byzantine Empire? Because it pops up uh, in church history uh, when, when, uh, when they go to find translations, to put translations into English, okay? Um, what's the best way to do that? We'll, we'll talk about this again. Best way is to find as many documents as you can, right? To see if, uh, as close to the original. Well, the Byzantine Empire has, is a family that controls some documents. Rome is a family that controls some documents. Alexandria is a family that controls some documents, okay? And so when they have these old documents, you know, the Byzantine Empire shows up. So what is the Byzantine Empire? Well, Constantine moves the capital of Rome to Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, Turkey. So he says to his, the Senate and everybody, he says, we're, pick, we're packing up Rome and we're moving it to my city. Okay, you can see that Constantinople is named after Constantine. Okay, so he sets up a new capital to Rome. Um, and this capital is the Byzantine Empire. What this does is this allows the bishop in Rome, who stayed because the church stays in Rome, uh, and you can see where this fake document is going to come into play. Well, Constantine left us land. Okay? So this allows the bishop in Rome to lead the church without political control. Who becomes the biggest political authority in Rome? The bishop of Rome who becomes what we call a pope. Okay? So... The, what, what happens is that now that Constantine moves the capital, so all the Senate and everybody goes to him with him to Constantinople, but the church stays and develops political power. So now, now Rome has two major, you have the capital, which is Constantinople, and then you have Rome, um, but you can't call it the Roman Empire if it's not run from Rome. Right? Um, so what happens then is the church then functions in the west, which is Rome, and in the east, which is Constantinople. Okay, so now we talked about a church divide. Well, this helps that church split that happens um, and, and is, is one of the major contributing factors because now the Rome church is doing their thing and the Constantinople church the Eastern Church is doing their own thing. And um, we're, we're going to see some of the differences between the two. Okay, so the Byzantine Empire then uh, gets set up and is being run uh, from Constantinople and instead of Rome. Rome still has political power. Rome is still politically influential. Uh, Rome is still where the, you know, the capital was, but uh, now the major central, central hub has been moved and you get what's called the Byzantine Empire. And um, it, so it, it, it gets kind of confusing uh, when the two are existing at the same time. So there was also a split in the church between the West the Rome church, and the east, Constantinople. And 
here's some of the things that contributed to that. Rome added the Nic added to the Nicene Creed without an ecum ecumenical meeting. So that Nicene Creed that we looked at, uh, to be honest, um, I I didn't I, I I gave you the revised one when we looked at that. That wasn't the original one. The original one didn't have the Virgin Mary mentioned in it. Um, it also said I instead of we. Okay, um, the one that I gave you uh, a few weeks ago is the accepted one now. Okay, so we say well, that's the Nicene Creed, and that's why I just pulled it off offline and 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 showed it to you guys. But so there were a few things that were added. Now they'll say they called a meeting, but they called a meeting of their churches. Okay, so the West had a meeting. And they changed it, but they didn't invite the East. Okay? Um, or they'll say, well, they didn't show up. Well, and the East is going, wait a second. You changed this thing that we voted, that we, we, we hold as true. You changed it without us. And so there comes a split. Right? You can see that happen. That happens in churches all the time. Right? We've, we've seen churches split over lesser things than that. Right? Uh, churches split over... Uh, um, had a professor tell me he, he had a church that split over a bug that was flying around the pastor's head and they couldn't decide if it was a horse fly or a bumblebee. And so they split. <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous story, but uh, it's a true story, right? And so you have the church that's the bumblebee church and the church that's the horse fly church. Um, just by that designation, I think I would go to the bumblebee church. Just... Um, show up to town. Well, you can choose to be a horsefly or a bumblebee. I think I'll be the bumblebee. It's funner to say, and it's not a horsefly. Um, but uh, so the, there's this church split that, that happens uh, because the, that's one of the reasons. Well, they start doing their own things. One, Rome used unleavened bread in the Eucharist, and the East used leavens. So they, they're using yeast in, in their bread. So the, the more the orthodox doesn't care about having big fluffy white bread um, as opposed to uh, cracker style or, or, or something else, a, a, um, a little wafer. They had switched to that wafer and a little shot of wine for you. Um, but... Uh, this, this, this is a big deal. Now, this isn't really something that we have talked about. Leaven in, uh, th this could have been, we could have stopped here for one session and discussed leaven as opposed to unleavened bread uh, because it was actually one of the philosophies that helped shape um, a lot of the church. But even today, we, we still have discussions of Protestant or, or, or Catholic. Okay, do we do we use leaven in bread to to serve at Lord's Supper? Now we uh, we do not as as this Baptist church, but I've been to Baptist churches that do. You get a big loaf of French bread, and you're good to go. All right, you just tear off a piece, dip it in your grape juice, eat it, walk out. Okay, I've seen Lord's Supper done that way. Um, uh, wasn't that long ago we were at a um, at a at a uh, meeting uh, for our um, ministerial alliance and did the same sort of thing. There was leaven in that bread. Can we take of the Lord's Supper with leaven in the bread? So one side, the Roman Catholic Church is saying, no, you can't. It equates sin, and so you have to remove that because we're representing the flesh of Jesus that had no sin, and so. We remove the leaven because that's what God he says, you know, leaven equates to sin and how it works in, in a person's body. Now, the East says, look, that's just, that's one thing versus another, you know. So, it doesn't mean that we're saying that Jesus had sin when we're taking leaven in the bread. Uh, but, um, 
you know, just because the scripture says that leaven equals sin doesn't mean that this means that Jesus was a sinner. Okay. So you have this, this debate going on and, uh, and even one that Baptists haven't settled. Okay. Um, so let's, let's have a, a minor discussion on that for just a second. So what, what do you think? I mean, as a church, we practice no leaven on the We actually bake special bread that has no leaven in it um, to take Lord's Supper with um, instead of buying the little wafers. Um, so what do, what do you think on the subject? If, if a person takes leaven in the Lord's Supper, is that sinful or does that change the message of the Lord's Supper? Okay, okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make a ruling. I'm not gonna make a ruling. Just, I mean, I would, I would agree with going with the unleavened, just because it, it makes what Jesus used in the Last Supper. He had unleavened, but does it matter? No, I wouldn't think so. Okay. I mean, it really doesn't matter. But other than just trying to make it that clear. Okay, so you would say it does doesn't matter really. Leaven in the bread. Go ahead. I think it does. You think it does matter? Okay. Because once you start moving away from the symbolism mm -hmm. of what the leaven was for in the scripture, the next thing we'll move to is okay, baptism doesn't have to be by immersion. Okay. Or other symbolisms. So if you so it would um, you you would fall on the side that um, um, oh man why is his name escape me um, major theologian that if I said his name you guys would know it um, hmm <laughs> no, Jim um, man I can see his face and everything um, but anyway in his in his in his book what every Christian ought to know. Um, I thought that was going to spark it for me. Um, no, it's not Geisler. Uh, he's 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 passed away. He's been he's been gone for a while. Um, anyway, he says about baptism: if you change the mode, you change the message. And so you would you you might follow that same argument of adding leaven to the bread. If you change the mode, you change the message, and and therefore can lead you to a, a theology. That you don't want. Yeah. And then that's that's what people say. You got something? What? No. Um, Are you arguing with Google? That's, that's not who I was thinking of. Y'all are going to make me find this book later. <laughs> um, well, yeah. The fruit of the vine is what? Grape juice. What makes grape juice wine? So, fermentation process. So, yeah. you can still have grape juice unfermented. And it's not wine. Then I'm just getting back to what Jesus was Right, so we, we, we will get into this discussion because during the Reformation, we're going to cover um, Lord's Supper quite a bit. Um, so we'll, we'll get into this discussion again um, when, when we start to decipher those things. Um, but... Uh, yes, okay, so... No, you're you're fine. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm not making a ruling on it because that's not something that has been settled even today. Um, the the other thing um, that also caused a split. Well, this this caused a split in the church, and we'll do it again and again and again. But uh, this this one, um, Rome required clerical celibacy. The East allowed their priests to marry. So Rome 
early on starts to say, well, our priests, our bishops, they can't get married. And so they, they require this celibacy, whereas the, the Eastern Church uh, does not. They, they say, no, it's fine. They can get, uh, they can get married. Uh, they can have families, um, which will once again also become in the Reformation when we start dealing with the Anglican Church and uh, Lutheranism, you know, what do we do with this, okay? Um, and so this is not a, a fight that's going to be settled uh, anytime soon. But the, So these are some of the major factors as to why there's a split between the East and the West. Okay, changing of the Nicene Creed, um, using leaven as opposed to unleavened bread, and then requiring uh, priests uh, to pr practice clerical celibacy. Yeah. The bishop in Rome says, no, because we were first, we should do it. Right. There, there's, there's actually, there, this isn't the reason that, that Rome actually takes over as the head. We can, we can see that they're gaining a lot of power. Um, and the bishop in Rome is uh, gaining a lot of power, has political power, had political power before, uh, before Constantine moves the capital. But... Um, yeah, you, you, you're also, you're having two, you're having a, a fight between basically popes. You're, you're going to have basically two popes at this point in time. Um, we're we're going to see what happens and, and why that, why Rome wins out. So Rome falls. Now this is the nation of Rome. This isn't the church in Rome. Rome falls around 460 to 570 AD. So, the governing authority in the West kind of just breaks down, all right? Now, you still have the, uh, the emperor, but he's in Constantinople. He's no longer in Rome. And so, the governing, the political unit, just kind of breaks down taxes. The, the, the Europe gets tired of paying taxes, gets tired of being drained. Um, and all of these nations that had been conquered by Rome start to rebel. And Rome basically loses its authority as a governing agent in the West. Okay? So that's where... Like, now you have England, you have Switzerland, you have Germany, you have Poland, you have all of these different po political entities, they pop up, okay? So, so here, here's what happens. The individual regions in Europe divide into their own smaller kingdoms and develop their own languages. So what this is, is this is the Middle Ages, right? Or the Dark Ages, Um that that is that is that we talk about you know so you get like kings and queens and you get the stories of like king arthur and uh these different you know british royalty and you get like you know the the russia has an authority and you get all these stories you have all these kingdoms that start to pop up and that's that's the reason that was able to happen the reason what a month ago two weeks ago we we were mourning the death of a queen in England. Not, I mean, a friend of mine had the best response. And they said, uh, "Mark safe from caring about what happens in England since 1776." So uh, that's kind of where I was at. You know, like, great. <laughs> you know, um, I'm sorry the queen died. She's she you know been there forever. Um, her, her faith was great. Um, uh, you know, her faith that, you know, being the head of the Anglican church, you know, that, that, you know, she, she, she had, from what I understand, she had a deep faith in Jesus Christ and in God. But, uh, but that comes for, through a lot of political turmoil. But 
what happens is all of these regions divide up. And they start to develop their own languages or revert back to the languages that they had before they were conquered uh, by Rome. But Rome still, you know, the Byzantine Empire still is functioning. Okay, so Rome is still there as far as the, the governing authority. It's just it lost control in the West. And so it, it falls uh, and that's what we say, well, it falls. And I say, and, and you're like, but that's 110 years. Yeah, it took a little while. Okay, they, they didn't give it up. You know, it just wasn't like, well, you know, just pull all the soldiers away. We'll just leave it. It, it took a little while, but we can see where it progressed from 460 to 570. Um, especially, um, you know, they, they, ne they were never able... Rome was never able to really conquer Germany, which you can see later in their history. They're stubborn people. <laughs> you know, like, we're not going to let you conquer us. I mean, even after World War I, after they were defeated, they were like, nope, let's start another one. You know, that's just kind of the way they are. You know, um, not, not, not to be, you know, prejudiced or anything. I'm just, that's the history of Germany has been always been that way. Okay, and uh, they were never able, but so Germany has their own, um, and all these other entities start to divide up into their own smaller languages. Um, the Byzantine Empire still exists uh, in, in Constantinople, um, but the unifying factor in the European region is the church. So the church is still there. The church stays. Christianity is still there. And so there's this unifying factor among all of these regions is the, the Catholic Church. And so we see that um, this, uh, this church has authority, political power, and has control over a pretty much a continent, okay? Because of the mission work that's been happening uh, the expansion of Christianity, the monasteries, and all of these things, we start, we see that the church takes control um, after the fall of Rome. So then uh, there's something else that happens. So the birth of Islam. This is a major, major event that happens during this time. So Mohammed declares a new religion mixed with Jewish, Christian, and Arabian traditions. And that's what, that, that's what Islam is. Okay, it had uh, Jewish parts to it, it has Christian parts to it, and it has Arabian traditions to it. Um, and so he pulls all this together, and he declares kind of a new religion by... Uh, declaring Jesus a prophet and himself as the promised Holy Spirit. So he's using what the church is, has, has said, you know, the, the whole, the Jesus said the Holy Spirit was coming. That's why he said, Jesus was declaring me, that I'm, I'm, I'm the one who is coming. Okay, so, um, so he, he starts this, uh, this movement. Now, after the death of Muhammad, and it grows quickly, it grows uh, rapidly among the Arabian side. Okay, so where the Byzantine Empire doesn't have jurisdiction or rule, go east of that into uh, Saudi Arabia, um, down down the Arabian Peninsula, um, because you ever you ever you know. They pray to Mecca, right? Which is down south there. Um, so that area becomes this, you know, this religion. So outside of the Byzantine Empire, uh, this religion pops up. After the death of Muhammad, Islamists decide to take control of the entire world. And, you know, if you've, anybody ever read the Quran? I don't recommend it. Um, I have one, just for uh, just for reasons of I wanted to kind of kind of see some of the things, and and mostly I got it because I wanted to see what it says about Jesus. And oddly enough, uh, the gospel of Jesus is presented in 
the Quran. Um, it's 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 very it's very it's odd. It's weird, um, but it's in there, and uh, so it talks about Jesus. Uh, but if you read some of the other stuff, you're like, that's a fascinating story, um, or that's a weird take on that, I guess. Um, but that's that's what he did. He he writes this the Quran, um, and they would say, well, I can't. I can't decipher it because it's not written in the, its original language, so it's not. You have a terrible translation because I have an English one. I can't read it in uh, whatever language it was written in to begin with. But, um, but so by reading his writings, they start to go, "Hey," which you would. We're the true religion. Our Muhammad was the promised Holy Spirit. He's the one that Jesus said was coming. We're his followers. Let's go take the world. Only their taking the world is by force. Okay? So they were stopped. They, they wage a war. Um, and this will lead into crusades. And during that time, uh, they were stopped and defeated in France. They did take control of much of Eastern Church, which controlled Northern Africa. So they were able to take the Northern Africa part, which is why um, Egypt and those northern countries are very much um, uh, Islamists. And uh, there's a lot of work going on in there. But remember, Egypt was once a Christian country uh, before, the, before this happened. Okay, um, so the Islamists, uh, so they take control of Northern Africa, and where Islam took control, Christianity grew stagnant because of extreme persecution. It was, if you're a Christian, we will kill you, and they meant it. And so they started executing Christians, uh, mostly by crucifying them and things like that. And so if you've ever witnessed a crucifixion and that's your threat of death, if you follow, you're probably going to give it up because that's, that's, it's the, it's, it is the worst way that the Romans ever devised in, in which to kill a person. Um, and they were good at killing people. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yes. That, that Abraham is the father of yes. So they claim Abraham is their father. Um, so he went to the to the the Ishmaelites. So these these people would have been the descendants of Esau more than Ishmael, where he went. Um, I don't know if he claimed to be a descendant of Ishmael. He might have. Um, I think I've heard that. Um, didn't didn't really come across it in my. Uh, research on all this, but uh, the Esau, Edom, so that Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, is where that that's where Esau and the Edomites went was, was down there, and so he, uh, so that's you know that's the conflict between Esau and Jacob. Um, Esau is the one that's supposed to have the 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 promise, but um, he sold it for a, you know, a bowl of soup. So you can kind of see how history is playing into all of this even then. Okay, so um, they, that's, um, that's one of the... So the birth of Islam uh, really plays a part in Christian history in that uh, they started to take control of where the church was. Um, and has always been in opposition to Christianity and Judaism, um, even though that it was it was birthed out of both traditions along with Arab traditions. Um, you you still get this uh, this this religion that pops up and is um, you know I I know that there are. There are peaceful Muslims that just, you know, want to live in peace and do their thing and worship the God the way they want to. But 
as a whole, um, it was birthed into war and has been fighting wars uh, ever since and is, has been pretty much in a constant state of war since the 600s. Since, since Muhammad's death, Islam has pretty much been in a constant state of war of some kind or, of, or another. Even to the point that even Thomas Jefferson writes about having to send ships, a Navy fleet, to go and fight because they're taking over shipments that America is receiving. Okay, Even in its early days, there's still this, this, this fight that's going on. Okay, and so there's there's this uh, this war that's 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 been happening. Okay, since they've been since the inception. So I wasn't going to cover this, but we're going to cover it a little bit. And this is all I'm really going to cover um, is just just these next couple of slides uh, to talk about the Crusades. Now, um, I, I, I found this quote. Um, uh, found this quote. And it says this, for several centuries, Western Europe poured its fervor and its blood into a series of expeditions. The hope was to defeat the Muslims who threatened Constantinople, to save the Byzantine Empire, to reunite the Eastern and Western branches of the church, to reconquer the Holy Land, as well as other territories that Islam had previously taken by means of a similar use of military force. So what that says is that the western part, which is now absent of Rome, their individual countries, says, hey, we need to go reclaim some of these things, and they're going to use the methods that have been used against them. Um, so here's what happens. The Muslims gain control of the Holy Lands, through the conquering of the uh, Seljuk Turks. These, these Turks have accepted Islam. And they decide, we're going to go conquer uh, land. And I mean, like I said, they marched all the way to France before they were defeated and pushed back. Okay, But they, so the, this fight starts uh, between two religions. Who has claim over this area of land that today we call Israel. Okay. Is that fight still raging? Yes. It's still raging even today. Uh, we're talking about, you know, Palestine and all of that that's going on there. Okay. So the church, the, the Western church had emphasized pilgrimages to the Holy Land to atone for post-baptism sins. Okay. Now, now remember that they need they needed to find a way to that they could say we're devoted to this thing because martyrdom had stopped, and so we saw that the rise of the monks, and uh, so one of the other things that pops up is later the church says, "Hey, you should take a pilgrimage that will show your dedication if you go and see these holy places because now you have." The Church of the Sepulchre, okay, built on top of the land or on top of the tomb where Jesus is supposedly was buried. You've got a church in Bethlehem. You've got a church on top of uh, Mount Sinai uh, in Egypt. So you've got all of these relics and all of these places that are mentioned in the Bible that the church has said, you take a pilgrimage, you're showing your devotion to the church. So, for centuries, the church has been, people in the church have been taking these pilgrimages. When the Muslims took control, it made it difficult for Christians to seek out relics and holy places. So when they take control of these lands, it makes it difficult for the church people to go to them. Okay, so they take control of the of Jerusalem, so you've got, and they take control of Bethlehem, and they take control of these areas, and so it makes it hard for Christians to to make these pilgrimages. So the Pope, the Western Church, Urbane II, 
at the Council of Claremont in 1095 asked for support to help the Byzantine Empire reclaim Jerusalem from the Turks. So the Western Pope, because what did he want? He want they want to bring the, reunite the church, free the Holy Lands. They want to do this. So he puts out his, uh, he, he puts out and he says, hey, uh, church, you know, the, to the French, to the Germans, to the English, hey, let's go on these trip and go, go help the Byzantine Empire. So this is where you get the Knights of Templar and all of these, these, these knights that go on these noble quests to go and free uh, the, the, the Holy Lands from the Turks who have now taken control. Okay? Um, and, uh, and, and so this, this movement goes. So what ended up happening was the church developed a lifestyle of crusading because crusades bring money. You, you got to fund them, okay? So you can start taxing people. Well, we have to fund these wars. Crusades bring money. And plus when they go and they sack a town, they bring back the wealth, okay? So there's a lot of dishonest things that are happening. A lot of things that we would probably say are not Christian-like happening. The first crusade has a noble intention, but the church then goes, hey, let's do another one and another one and ends up having seven, eight, ten crusades, you know, that are to do different things and go different places and just basically rage war. So they develop a lifestyle style of crusading. And on the fourth crusade, Constantinople fell to the Western church and then eventually fell to the Ottoman Empire in 1453. So Rome then officially is gone. But what ends up happening in the fourth crusade, instead of uniting the two churches, the Western church says, we're just going to wipe you out. We're going to take control. And that's what they did. And that's what, how you get the Roman Catholic church as the biggest influence in doctrine, political power, is because um, Constantinople is constantly fighting Islamists and they can't win, and they're losing ground all the time, and then the Western Church eventually says, we'll attack you too. And that's what happens. So they took control through military force because of their quests for crusades. So um, any questions on anything tonight? That's, that's going to be where we're going to end, uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, to uh, the 1300s next week. So any questions on that in between time, that thousand years, we just, I mean, we jumped a thousand years. You probably never covered a thousand years in history class in school that fast. Yeah. Yeah, so we've been, we've, Christianity and Islam have been at odds for 1,400 years. And I don't think that it'll fix in the next 1,400 years. And I'm not arguing, I'm just saying of Jesus, Terry. Okay. Um, Yes. Yep. And that was a big deal when John F. Kennedy ran. Right. Our first Catholic president. Good ones. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So what we've seen over, okay, 
So what we, what we saw in that thousand years is the absolute complete control of the Roman church. They, they completely take control. Um, and we're going to see where that leads starting in the 1300s next. But what we're seeing today, I believe, is there's been a rapid decline in the power that the Catholic Church has. Um, politically, around the world, and even in their, their numbers. Um, they're, they're, the, 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 only, the only reason I think that the Catholic Church exists is that they were well-funded for thousands of years. And, but um, as, as far as numbers, uh, you know, around the world, there's still a lot of Catholics. But in the United States, it's diminishing very quickly. I mean, so, but so is Baptists and, and other denominations. But um, political, we've never been a political entity. And so they're, they're, they're you know, they're, um, you know, so, so their political power has definitely diminished over the last hundred years quite drastically. Um, yeah, so uh, any, any other questions? Any, anything that uh, you wanted to clear up? I, I just really wanted to cover how, how we see that the Catholic Church uh, becomes the entity that it was that's going to set up the Reformation for us. All right, well, uh, we'll say that that's it for tonight, and uh, we'll be dismissed, and uh, we will pick up uh, in the 1300s, and we'll start a pre-Reformation um, looking at some of the, the people and ideas that started to come up uh, prior to Martin Luther uh, nailing his thesis to the door of Wittenberg in 1517. So we're going to look at uh, some of those ideas. Um, uh but yeah, let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. And we pray that uh, even though we have these times where we don't uh, dive into your word or, or look at uh, some of the scriptures, Lord, but that uh, we can look at history to, to see where we are and how we got here, Lord. And that uh, we see how you are present through all of it and that you are guiding your church, that you are guiding uh, the things that happen, and, and God, that you're still a part of it there, even though that we might see, well, man, it doesn't look like the church is following your will, but God, we know that you're there, Lord. And so, God, we, we, we thank you for all that you do for us today and all that you've done uh, in the past to get us to where we are, Lord. We praise you in your son's precious name. Amen.